Welcome to Organize Strike Repeat, a web series that highlights the work of organizers in the Democratic Socialists of America. We share concrete experiences, campaigns, and strategies that move us toward democratic socialism. I'm Kevin Richardson, a philosophy professor and member of the DSA National Political Committee. And I'm Maggie Johnston, therapist, graduate student, and organizer with NC Piedmont DSA. In this episode, we interview Simone, a filmmaker who organizes with DSA Los Angeles. She talks to us today about her film, $16,000, and the role of art and culture in leftist organizing. So could you talk a little bit about uh, what's the yeah, basic idea of your film, $16,000, um, to start off? Yeah, well, thanks, Kevin and Maggie, for having me, of course. I'm happy to be on this podcast. And uh, yeah, I did... Uh, decide to throw my life away and make a movie last year and it took up every waking hour of my life but it turned out very well i'm very happy with the product sixteen thousand dollars it's a narrative short comedy about reparations uh, but it's not making fun of reparations at all i'm very pro reparations it is just kind of highlighting the tropes of what reparations would look like if it were just a check and if that check were for the lowest amount it possibly could be because when have black people really won anything <laughs> so i think that when we talk about uh, reparations uh, we shouldn't just reduce it to a monetary value uh, if you want to give us money great but if you want to give us real structural change as well that'd be really awesome and so that's kind of what the film uh, you know sets up as an entry point because Going into the project, we learned that 70% of white people actually dis disapprove of reparations. Uh, so we went in with the mindset that we're going to have to win over a lot of people. Uh, and that includes people on the left as well, which, you know, shocking, but not really shocking. But, you know, this is uh, something that is a reparative justice for a crime that's been committed. And it could be for any group. It's not just African Americans. Uh, you know, any group that a crime has, uh, has been committed against them uh, deserves rep reparations. And that's kind of, you know, the starting point for this project. Yeah, I really loved the film. And something that really stood out to me um, <laughs> is that you deal with these, you know, pretty complex uh, social justice issues, but it's the film's hilarious throughout. I mean, it goes really hand in hand. It's like really funny, really entertaining, really enjoyable. And I think even if you're like a super leftist, you come away learning something new and uh, challenging kind of how you think about an issue that really, really is relevant in our time. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, how you kind of mix, uh, how you create this like comedic product, but a product that really matters? Yes. Well, I mean, I'm not a serious person most of the time. Uh, I am a comedy show booker in LA. Uh, also, uh, I, you know, just hang out with a lot of comedians. And this is kind of where the starting point was. I met up with Bertie Reed and Ellington Wells, who co-star and co-wrote the film. Uh, and you know, we were trying to come upon a subject that was appropriate for the times. Um, and at the time we didn't realize, you know, how big of uh, a comeback reparations was really gonna have. Uh, so think about, you know, March, 2019, that was, you know, it feels like forever ago, but <laughs> I think, uh, you know, when we sat down, we were really talking about the democratic primary um, and how reparations was coming up very frequently and not really taking um, you know into account what you know the black community wants um, and of course you know the black community hasn't come to an agreement on this subject either um, but i think that when we talk about reparations we should be trying to figure out a solution for that community uh, not just talking over their heads or using it as a bargaining chip uh, for your campaign platform uh, and so you know just the idea that we haven't received a check or anything at all this, you know, for this period of time, like 400 years, that's funny to me. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that's funny to other people, but it's funny to me because you have to laugh at something like, you know, it's not a funny subject like slavery is not funny at all. But the fact that we are still talking about this to this day and it's still used in like common, you know, presidential campaigns is just like something that they can flail around in the air and say, hey, maybe you'll get this. Um, you know, I don't see that 
working. <laughs> and I, don't, I just like, I feel like uh, we're over it and we kind of want to decide for ourselves what we want. Um, and this film is just more of an entry point. I think, you know, too often, uh, you know, socialists stay away from the subject. And I thought it'd be really great to have some Afro-socialists tackle this subject in an, an approachable way where people can engage with it and just, you know, not feel like they're being talked over uh, or talked over their heads. It's really just relatable. Uh, and that's where really the comedy comes in because these are people that you could know. <laughs> and it's just like a Twilight Zone kind of scenario. Um, if it happened, um, you know, I don't think it's going to, you know, I feel like it would just be real and grounded. And if it were just a check for such a small amount of money, what would you buy? <laughs> like, what could really change in your life? Uh, and you would, you know, find out not much. But uh, yeah, it's just, you know, a comedy of errors, I guess. That's what it is. Yeah. And yeah, when I was watching it, I was like, oh, this is really funny. <laughs> um, not that I expected it to not be funny, but I was like, oh, this is this is actually, this is like amazing. Um, I was super like excited. And so when you talk about how you have like, you know, one, you're like naturally, like you said, not a super serious person. You have a comedic element to you clearly. And then also you're around a bunch of um, like people who are doing comedy in LA, I assume. And so like, I think it's really cool, the creative energy that, that came behind it. Cause I really felt it like watching it. It didn't feel like one person was the, you know, just coming up with their own very specific kind of humor, but like, yeah, a bunch of people throwing stuff in and punching up the script. And oh, I was like, yeah. okay, it's very, that sounded really good. Yeah. I mean, um, everyone I casted were people that I knew maybe except for one person who got into the film because of a recommendation of another person that was in the film. And I think as a comedy booker, like I'm surrounded by people funnier than me all the time. Uh, so it kind of challenges you to be funnier or like to think of things in a different way. Um, and of course, like when we were at the pre-production phase of this, there are a lot of people who didn't think that we could make this subject funny or didn't believe that you know, like this was something that even the DSA fund um, backed, you know, and some people didn't agree with that. Uh, but you see, I'm a good investment. And I <laughs> basically, um, I'm introducing new audiences to this socialist take on reparations. Uh, we haven't really seen reparations play out uh, in this way ever. We've seen a Dave Chappelle sketch, uh, which you know, it has, it's funny, but it's not necessarily getting to the deep root of what's going on. Um, and we saw Watchmen. Uh, hopefully, I don't know if both of you have seen the new season of Watchmen. Um, but that was like very dramatized and very, very good. Like, I love it. This, on the other hand, is a comedy. And I have not seen that um, done in this way, where we're still pushing forward a message but people walk away, you know, feeling conflicted. And I, I think that's okay. Like, you know, um, you know, it's okay to let people digest a topic and really ponder it and think about it. It's really, you know, this film was meant to start a dialogue on, you know, a very tough subject. And uh, yeah, and the people in it definitely punched up the script. I was definitely uh, lucky to have all these great people involved whom, you know, our talented comedians, look any of them up. I'm sure you would really enjoy their stand-up comedy. Uh, and I've gotten to see them grow and evolve over the years as a comedy booker and booking them on my shows. So yeah, it was just a great collaboration overall. You know, I think too, it avoids, I mean, I think it's really important that on the left, we have uh, media that we can consume that's not just uh, like, uh, <laughs> I don't know, like a reading group devoted to Marx or like something extremely like preachy and kind of, you know, not that enjoyable to consume. Um, do you have any thoughts about like what role this kind of media can can play for us on the left? Uh, of course, I think um, you're right. You're right, Maggie. Like everything doesn't have to be a reading group and, you know, everything doesn't also have to be an old documentary either. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I think um, when we talk about uh, a working class space, we talk about reaching, you know, to the masses for, you know, this movement. 
everyone is different. Everyone has different roles in the movement as well. Um, so when we think about it in that way, yes, like a reading group will speak to a certain segment of people and that's awesome. We definitely need it there, but we also need art to engage with other people who are able to understand through art. You know, it's, you know, different personalities come into play for sure. And it's not, you know, talking down to say, you know, I'd rather engage with this piece of art than, you know, this other scenario that is a reading group. I think both are valid, both are important. Um, and one isn't necessarily better than the other, you know. Yeah, no, I, I think films are be better than reading groups. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna die on that hill. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I also, you know, so it's going to be controversial, but could you tip, I don't know if you know Tyler Perry, but, <laughs> but could you tell him like to use writers because oh, it might make his, to write all of his own stuff. So <laughs> oh, I know <laughs> that's the, pro that's the problem. Oh, okay. I know. Yeah. Okay, I I'm think, not, um, Tyler Perry is, um, yeah, he would definitely be, uh, like he would be better off if he let more voices, you know, in on his projects, I think. Um, but there's a market for him apparently. So, you know, yeah. there's, you know, some people enjoy it so they can, you know, enjoy it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this was just my obligatory shot at Tyler Perry's um, work uh, and writing. So and I, you, you'd be surprised, you know, to. attending black film festivals my, well, the first one in person, but the rest online, of course, because of COVID. But a lot of shots are taken at Tyler Perry. A lot of shots are taken at other movies like The Help and uh, Hidden Figures and, you know. And I think it is a generational curve. Like, I think, um, you know, the aunties and, you know, your mama, they basically love that stuff. Like, it's like, feed me more of uh, you know this lifetime movie-esque uh, black story and <laughs> that's what they like uh so i you know i think the next you know generation coming up really is taking harder subjects um or you know in more subversive kinds of ways i think uh and that's cool to see I, you know things are changing <laughs> and i think um we're getting to see different sides of the black experience and you know more experiences are going to be understood instead of just like a flat um you know portrayal of what a black person is um earlier you mentioned when we were talking about um you know different types of media we need different types of media in our movement uh, you mentioned engaging people through art and one thing i'm curious about is what do you think arts role is in terms of like engaging people, particularly like in DSA organizing? Um, I think um, to, well, I can only speak to LA because that's the chapter I'm in. Um, we do have an agitprop committee. Uh, and I think that in its origin, it was a lot more active in making like original stuff. Um, but I think over time it became more of like an uh, admin kind of group for the rest of the chapter, like, oh, make this poster, make this thing. Um, but I think that it's really important to still continuously uh, create and ideate. And, you know, the movements of the 60s had songs. They had, you know, lots of agitprop. And I think that, you know, we could do better even now, you know, with this uprising, we could do a lot better. Um, because that's what sticks with people. And, you know, I don't know what the science, you know, like he be GB, like which doctor shit is going on. But I think like people just, they get it and they engage with it. And um, I think that it can't be discounted, you know, I don't discount it because it's what I like to do. <laughs> but I think a lot of people who uh, don't necessarily see it as a uh, as imperative or necessary don't see it in the same way but i think we need to leave room for lots of kinds of people to be engaged in dsa um, in different capacities um, there's this uh, racial justice advocate um, and she's also a lawyer but her name is deepa Iyer, and she's based out of dc uh, she has like a social change map and it's really great as a diagram and 
on you know face value you might think oh it's just like a way to you know put people into buckets but i'm like no actually sometimes like that's the best way to understand what everyone brings to a movement or an organization um you know some people are disruptors some people are you know more of the caregiver type some people are artists uh, and i think that we need to see that full spectrum of people within DSA be welcomed, uh, not marginalized. I think that everyone has a place uh, in the movement, <laughs> whether you are an artist or you are an academic. Um, and yeah, we just have to keep it open and loose, you know. Absolutely. I mean, debate's still out about academics, but artists for sure. And <laughs> I, um, I mean, I think I just really resonate with what you're saying. and. I think too, it's so important, you know, we're trying to build this future, this beautiful future, but we need to have like something that we enjoy, something that like gives us uh, a place where we have fun, communities where we connect with people. And I think it's like a lot easier to do that personally when you have uh, good art that you can share together, so. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, and not everyone enjoys um, art and music. You'd be surprised. I have friends who say, I don't like music. You know, there are people out there like that. So like, and that's fine. I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm just saying that there should be a space for every kind of person who wants to engage in political activism. Um, there's no reason why, you know, like making a film to be treated differently from, you know, being on an action. Although I do both, uh, I would not say, hey, Boots Riley, why'd you make Sorry to Bother You? That was, you know, a great piece of propaganda for, you know, workers' rights, but it, you weren't at the protest, so whatever, you know. <laughs> right, like one of the things when we were thinking about like the people to have on this podcast, cause you know, we were thinking about, okay, definitely wanna feature some workplace organizers, some people doing electoral work. Um, and I also thought like a lot of times, yeah, culture, work, art, it just goes, it's just excluded from being thought of as an organizing project. Um, as a as the kind of thing that could advance democratic socialism, and we thought like to me that's very upsetting, <laughs> because it seems very clear that, I mean, uh, I was talking to my partner the other day about um, how many fire fire um, firemen shows <laughs> there are <laughs> on TV. It's like Chicago Fire and this fi like this, and they have almost the same names. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and I mean, that's propaganda in itself, the amount of like cop shows that are on TV. Yes. Um, we have so many things that we're up against. It's not just the overt racism or the overt oppression. It's, you know, very subversive. It's in every aspect of our capitalist society. So when you talk about art being used as a tool, it absolutely can. Um, I don't know if like if both of you are fans of Sorry to Bother You, I'll bring it up again, but um, seeing the worry-free ad in the film, I was like, well, damn, you know, I'm never gonna think about uh, Amazon without thinking about worry-free now. <laughs> and then uh, during this pandemic, of course, seeing Amazon's commercials, I don't know if you've seen those, but they literally are worry-free ads. They literally are. They have people saying how much they love being there during COVID times. It's ridiculous. Um, and so I think that you know, we're in a very weird time where this this election, it will be one with propaganda because, uh, you know, we're not going to see the on the ground game that we would normally see in a, a general election. Um, I mean, it, I'll argue the primary was also one with propaganda because, uh, you know, Biden bought a lot of ads in the South. He just did. Uh, a lot of people did. And it's just, you know, it sucks, but that's how a lot of people engage with politics <laughs> you know they don't engage on a micro level like we do they will see whoever's paying for an ad in their area whoever you know sounds the best looks the best this and that there's a lot of factors um and we ha we're up against a lot you know and i see it as somewhat like damage control like you know we're going to get um, a lot of, uh, you know, slander from the other side. And but we have to kind of meet that with our own propaganda and just do it better. Yeah, it's something um, I know Kevin has talked about before, like, <laughs> 
people on the other side, they're going to take up that space and they have a lot of money and they have a lot of time and a lot of resources to do that. But luckily for us, like our stuff is, is better and funnier and cooler. So I do think that's like the one thing we've got going for us. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, we can point back to AOC's um, ad. I think that was a game changer um, for the first time around when she was running. You know, these things do matter. And people from all across the country, probably even across the world, probably watch that ad. And, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I love AOC. I just don't like that Bernie guy. And literally it's like same politics for the most part. Um, someone that always was like very pro Bernie and campaigned for Bernie. And I think that, you know, like propaganda matters. I, you know, I don't know how else to put it, but she has a good propaganda game going on over there. Um, but yeah, I think um, we have to get creative because we won't win unless we get creative. We won't win socialism uh, unless we can literally beat capitalism at its own game. So yeah. All right. So I wanted to ask like, so you, you, you embarked upon this project um, to create a film, which is probably take a lot of your time and effort um, to, to actually create this thing as well as the effort of others. And one thing I'm thinking about is the fact that, you know, you, you have got more extensive background and training on this, this sort of thing. So it's not as if you suddenly out of the blue, or I mean, you may have suddenly out of the blue decided to create this film, but you have had like prior experience and training and connections and so on and so forth that allow you to actually do a good job at making this film, not just making it, but you know, uh, doing the fundraising, the overall production sort of stuff that you have to do. And yeah, I get, I wanted to ask about your, could you give a brief summary or brief description of like your background, where you were coming from with this kind of project. And if you could say something about how people could, people who don't have the kind of experience you do, how could they get involved in, you know, creating these kinds of projects? Yeah, I think um, I was lucky to have had uh, the comedy community really come and support this and a lot of the activist community come and support this as well. I think, um, you know, as far as formal training goes, uh, there are people who are better than me that have never taken a film course or don't like work in the field that like I work in. It's really an interesting time where, um, you know, a lot, a lot of the barriers to entry have been really pushed away because now you can record 4K on your cell phone um, where you find people, you know, who are good and who can be on your crew and support you. Um, really, the most difficult part is the fundraising, you know, I think you know, that is definitely harder than making the film. But as far as anyone who would want to get into this, I would say, go on YouTube, watch like uh, any kind of director dissect scenes that they've worked on, like all that stuff is out there now, which is really cool. Um, and also, I went through Seed and Spark to do our crowdfunding, which is a great platform for people who are from diverse backgrounds. Um, they really champion um, people who are like underrepresented in the film kind of space. Uh, and they have a high success rate on that platform as well, because they kind of walk you through everything. They assign a person to your whole project. They tell you what you need to do, how many contacts you have will raise this amount of money you know and so it's very hard still but i think like um now there are like resources out there that hadn't been there before which was really cool to see um but yeah my background i'm i wasn't actually um i didn't graduate with a film degree unfortunately i started out in film i got you know kind of sick of it after i took like one too many um classes with someone that uh, sounded like Daria. And so, I, <laughs> but I call myself the Black Daria, but I can't listen to myself. So I feel bad for both of you. Um, and so I, um, I feel like at that point, I was like, I'll just get a business degree and I'll just keep doing internships in the TV space. And that's what I did. Uh, but, you know, I'm gonna get dragged for this one, but I totally went into the like, uh, 
college like major list and I was like film what's next and it was finance (laughs) right underneath it um and so I basically suffered through the worst kind of business classes that there ever have been but I kind of learned what the enemy thinks and that was kind of humorous to me um sitting through ethics classes and listening to people just be like really gross human beings um because it was after 2008 um so ethics was like a big deal at the time so (laughs) um and so hearing people being like watching a documentary about sweatshops uh in china and then someone you know piping up and being like but they have fans you know they have fans uh and so that was kind of just like understanding the enemy sometimes is like really good Uh, whether or not you use like I had no intention on working in finance at all but I knew I could do math (laughs) I was like I can do math I'll graduate with a business degree um but it was very interesting because yeah like like I don't know like you can't just have ethics be one course in a business school like (laughs) it should be incorporated into every class that there is um it's just kind of humorous Uh, and then we wonder why our society is the way that it is you know yeah like i've had yeah my fair share of experiences of inadvertently just being in the presence of the enemy (laughs) um and like you know you might be going along with some ideas and then you're like wait a minute i don't (laughs) i don't (laughs) <laughs> no, I don't think that poor people deserve to die because they don't have enough. They'll make it sound great, though, you know. Yeah, very, you know, sound very neutral, you know, <laughs> objective standards and whatnot. Um, and yeah, I, I was I was trying to keep a straight face while you're talking about the ethics piece of it, because like as a as, as academic philosopher, we always kind of joke about you know, business ethics courses and how like, it's just, yeah, it, it, even from a, I guess, more liberal perspective, we it's just not even taken very seriously as far as these courses where, I mean, how, how sway, like, how do you make that work? Um, the business ethics. When... So you can't make it work because from its core, it's exploitative. So it's just interesting because you're educating a whole group of people on how to exploit others and not have a conscience so yeah yeah that's a it's a it's hard to like yeah it's like so i need to exploit y'all <laughs> ethics <I> need to exploit <laughs> y'all okay well you know people make the decisions um i want like to... here's your degree if you don't like if you don't get this you can't graduate <laughs> you know like yeah. it's just ridiculous I wanted to ask about um, how you, so you said earlier this was a socialist film, and I also know you're in uh, DSA, so could you talk a little bit about how you came to DSA, and I guess what what else kind of organizing work you might be doing currently or might be interested in? Yeah, I mean, I was first exposed to DSA in college, too, around the same time that I was a finance major. I didn't officially join though until after college uh, because, you know, at the time I was like, things can't be that bad, you know. (laughs) Uh, We had Obama in office. I was like, well, maybe that's a step in the right direction. Uh, And, you know, towards the end of the Obama era, um, I had moved out to LA at that point. I started engaging with DSA because, you know, I felt like I didn't see the change, the hope and change that was supposed to come out of the Obama era. Um, And so I had the rare opportunity to see DSA uh, really uh, struggling for life uh, right before the 2016 election. Like, it was like, there's no there there, you know, it's like, uh, not a lot of people, a lot of people from, you know, older generations that had just kind of stuck around. It was like more of a reading group, like DSA as a whole was like a reading group, (laughs) not like what it is right now. Um, And so, yeah, I was like, this is cool, I guess, like um, kind of hung out in the background of this. And uh, and then things changed after the 2016 election, it just changed in a big way. 
people were literally flooding the gates. Uh, we went from like a chapter of like 100 people to like uh, 2,000 people. <laughs> and so it went wild out here. Uh, lots of interesting people joined. We had a lot of like comedians join at the time. We like we really had people from like all walks of life. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that it's impressive to see how the organization has changed and evolved, um, but I also feel like it's still evolving, hopefully, um, into a place that can be more inclusive to BIPOC voices. Um, and so I currently engage with DSA, um, not only as an artist, but also uh, as a champion of racial justice. Um, and I work within the Afro-Socialist Caucus as well. Um, and I think like, you know, it is, you know, uh, I don't see it as being um, a tendency to be anti-racist, but I've been proven wrong, I guess, over the past year. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that was a tendency uh, that we could have comradely debate over. I thought that we all just kind of agreed that uh, we should be anti-racist, but apparently not. And I, you know, I don't, I don't like what I see with the, um, the minimizing of race um, as it relates to class. I like, you know, when I talk about race and class, they are intertwined um, and one isn't above the other because, you know, white supremacy is a structure of capitalism as, as is patriarchy. Um, I, you know, I don't separate them, but I think a lot of people are able to separate them simply because they don't have this kind of duality experience you know i am a woman i am black i am a socialist and a lot of people can just be like i'm default i'm the i'm the white person in the room i'm default and society mostly works for me uh, i do want these bigger ideas um you know medicare for all uh green new deal but as far as how race ties into that don't talk to me about that <laughs> And that's what I've, I'm seeing a lot. And I know that's not like in every chapter, but that's definitely in LA for sure. It's in every chapter. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I verified it. Can, <laughs> like, um, no, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think we need to progress. I think that um, tendency of being class reductionist is very incomplete. I think that, you know, go back to the drawing board and come back with some new ideas. Um, I think uh, it's, you know, it's an interesting time to be a class reductionist during the George Floyd uprisings <laughs> because I've seen people explain that away by just saying he was poor and that's why he was murdered. And, you know, I'm like, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but go off, you know, and do, do, do you. Um, but yeah, I think we will very much suffer um, if we allow this tendency to be the tendency. I think, you know, it is our job as uh, like actively anti-racist people <laughs> to stop that from happening because how will we engage with the broader working class, um, the multiracial working class that we say that we want to champion um, if we don't speak to their needs um, or we don't speak to their experiences. Um, and it's not just about uh, having representation and leadership in DSA. That's one thing that needs to happen. And congrats, Kevin. I'm very happy you're on the MPC. <laughs> I think that's very important. But we also need to make sure that on the local level that people are being heard and understood and not just, you know, tossed to the side or tokenized um, because that happens absolutely um, from what I've seen. Yeah, it's really frustrating to um, from a pragmatic level. If we're going to get serious about building a socialist majority, we actually have to, I don't know, speak to to people in this country and their needs, like you said. So really like it if we could get our shit together with that. <laughs> yeah, you and I and Kevin agree. So we're all friends. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Um, and like, just to go on the piece of, you know, it's not just, it's not just, you know, to have representation because I could, you know, I could represent on the NPC and sell y'all out. <laughs> you know, I, I could just be like, all right. Wait, are you undercover? Every, like... Yeah, I could just <laughs> okay. completely sell y'all out or um, I could, uh, do what I hope to do, which is 
to introduce the element of like anti-racism as a part of everything that we do, like feminism as a part of everything that we do. So it's not something that's set off to the side for the racial justice committee to deal with. But like when it comes to healthcare or electoral stuff, political education, you know, all of that's like non-racial, it's non-feminist, it's just the neutral stuff, which is, as we know, just going to be white male stuff at that point. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just to make sure, I, in general, we need people who are not just there for their, the identities they inhabit, but people who are there to push for the kinds of things that benefit um, the people of your identity. And yeah, I think that's an important thing to stress. And it's, it, it is really unfortunate that we have the kind of class reductionism that still exists because what that means is that for people like you, people like us, we're, we have to fight two fights um, because, you know, on the one hand, you know, you're making a film about a so socialist take on reparations. You know, on one hand, you have to fight the, you know, people, the class reductionists or people ostensibly on the left who are not the anti-anti-racists or just the racists, I don't know. Um, to fight the anti-anti-racist about things and about reparations. But then on the other hand, you have people on the right, um, you know, who either are against reparations, which most, you know, I suspect most, most people on the right are against reparations, but there's also, I guess, a burgeoning movement of right-wing people who are for reparations, but they're not for socialism and the kind of the, their kind of take on reparations. Are is you talking about that acronym group? Ooh, don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> We're not saying it. Either. Don't say it, Simone. <laughs> it's like um, Voldemort. <laughs> I don't say that word um, anymore. I learned my lesson. I think um, you're right. We do have two fights going on. Um, and, you know, I think that it is tiring. It is, you know, it's the same fight that we experience in our workplaces and it's like not what I want to experience in a volunteer organizing space. But I think that there are ways to um, make it better. Uh, we just have to start listening to each other a lot more. And, you know, it's not about perfect politics or anything like that. You know, I think there's going to be a lot of like, uh, you know, mistakes that are made. And I think that that's okay. Like, um, we're not here to like cancel each other. I just think that we need to listen a little bit more, especially during the times that we're in right now. Um, you know, we like the idea that we could be taking the lead from Black Lives Matter in a moment like this. I'm like, no, they got it. You know, <laughs> like, how can we support, you know, what they're doing? Um, because they've already had their demands uh, very plainly and clearly, and they're very anti-capitalist. And um, and we're lucky because in LA is the birthplace of BLM. We have like the founders here and all the women who really are out there and being you know adamantly anti-capitalist in their work. I know that's not true all across the country, but you know out here in LA, like there's no reason why DSA should be taking the lead from BLM. Um, and I think that, like, a lot of people are, are afraid of popular frontism, uh, but show me a different way <laughs> and then I'll, you know, then I'll agree because I think when you're trying to engage with the masses, um, like, there's not many ways to do that. So, yeah. Um, any, any just sort of general advice for someone who'd like to organize in this way, uh, in the way that you do with their DSA, maybe for like a smaller chapter like ours or somebody just starting out in this, like what's some advice you might give? Um, I would say look to where there's a need, you know, <laughs> and see like how you can um, make sure that, I don't know, like smaller chapters might not have like a diverse membership I know in LA, we certainly don't, we're a big chapter, um, but if there's a way to not tokenize someone, but empower them to lead um, a certain fight, um, that is a good way to plug in and just be like in a supportive role. Or if, like I said earlier, if there's a specific thing that you bring to the table, um, you know, make that known because no one wants to go like not it's not a one size fits all experience in TSA, you know, 
some people like the um longer like more boring meetings about stuff some people want to create stuff um and i think that dsa allows for both so <laughs> there has to be a niche you know that you can fit into um and as for me like um like when i'm making a film i'm obviously not um uh, like as actively engaged in DSA during those times because there's no way, um, you know, during those times I have to literally step back to create something <laughs> and then come back into the fold once it's finished. And I think that's perfectly fine too. There's no reason why, um, you know, you have to fit everything into your life at once. In fact, uh, you know, you'll never do anything well <laughs> unless you like focus on something. Uh, which I learned the hard way because I like to do a lot of stuff and I realized like the more attention you can give to something, the better it's gonna turn out. So, you know, the movement will be there when you get back to. Thank you. No, I really, I really enjoyed this. Um, I really enjoyed you uh, talking with us about the film and your, you know, ideas about how art and culture play into DSA and just DSA organizing stuff. So. Thanks again for coming on the, the podcast. Thanks for having me. I hope I Thanks didn't bore you. <laughs> we should Excellent. start a reading group together, though, before yeah. this is all over. Absolutely. I know Maggie in particular love would love mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I have some <laughs> Kropotkin just ready to read. That's yeah. a that's a philosopher, right? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's we can we can have one of those like three nights a week um, type <laughs> situations. A An hour and a half to three hours. No, I don't. I don't attend unless it's four hours. Okay, you're right. Oh, okay. We'll still cut corners here. Okay. <laughs> we can't even so, get into the subject. Um, yeah. <laughs> but actually, like um, a lot of people are looking for reading groups within DSA that are dope. I'd say Afro Socialists um, mm -hmm. Caucus has a great reading group. Uh, if you're looking to engage with people um, out in your community, well in quotes because we're all inside but no names book club they read really great books um, in that book club mm -hmm. that are socialist and anti-capitalist and feminist um, and so i very very much encourage um, any bipoc individuals who want to join that do that um, it's very cheap go on patreon like five bucks a month to be involved in that uh, and yeah and i guess that's all for me <laughs> so if people wanted to to like follow you or find your work what would they need to do um well my film sixteen thousand dollars is on every platform at 16k film and you can find me through there as well uh, very easy to find just look for the black person in the picture and that will be me just <laughs> <laughs> i'm just kidding um but basically yeah um, we'll be screening the film for the rest of the year. So try to catch a screening through AfroSoch um, or any kind of film festival that will be online for the foreseeable future. So it's been a really interesting year, but things are a lot more accessible now. So you have no excuse not to see the film. That's right. Very easy to see. <laughs> cool.